almost there, one hour until social time. Uh, but before that, it's social time. Um, I'd be very pleased to introduce Ade Oshinai to the stage. I've worked with him for the last three years, and he's given me a lot of insights into developer experience, crafting good software. And today, he's going to talk to you about growing with Google. Ade. Uh, you got All right. OK. <laughs> Sorry about this. It turns out I'm on last. But while we're, we're waiting for the slides to catch up, and while I fiddle with this, OK, I'm going to talk to you about growing with Google Plus. The parenthesis is deliberate. So I'm a developer advocate on Google. I've actually been here longer than everybody in the room. I've been at Google forever. But I thought I'd take a moment to actually just sort of find out a little bit about you. Because part of the job of an advocate is about listening to what you guys want. So I thought we'd try a little interaction. Can you stand up, please? OK. So, if you've never played Flappy Bird, sit down. All right, stay, stay standing. Okay. Anybody who's got a high score that's higher than five, stay standing. Anybody whose high score is less than five, sit. Okay. Less than 15. All right. Less than 25. Less than 40. Less than 60. Just take a moment here. This, uh, this is the hardcore. OK? OK, less than 100. Oh. All right, all right. Wait, 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 wait. Less than 200. Ah, it gets interesting. OK, we're down to the final two. OK, less than 300. Less than 350. OK, less than 400. Now nah, he has to go. So, I believe he's the king. So, if you follow him on Google Plus and play Flappy Bird, you'll see his high score is 358. 356, sorry. Um, there's actually somebody I know who has a better score than him. Rich, what device were you playing on? Nexus 5. Nexus 5. There's a cheat code? <laughs> no, it's called not having a life. It's a, well, it's, a, it's a very popular cheat code. Uh, my score is 64. I did that this morning. So we've now learned a little bit about you. Let's talk a little bit about Google and whether the projector works. OK, so I'm here to talk to you about the Google Plus platform. So up until the end of March, I'm a developer advocate on Google Plus. From April, we're changing things a little bit. We're moving away from this focus on specific platforms, specific products, and trying to think about the world in the way you see it. And the way you tend to see it is you see Google as one company, one service. You don't really care about our org chart. You want to think about, I want to use some service from Google, and this is just be able to just use it. You don't want to get told, oh, I'm sorry, that's not my department. You, know, you don't want to be told, oh, I'm sorry, that's not managed out of EMEA. Please talk to the person in the right department in New York. Oh, you're not in New York, that's unfortunate. You'd like a more holistic organization, and one of the things we're trying to do is to get there. One of the first things we did as part of that is we set up Google+. Part of this was to have a unified account system for all Google users. For example, I'll give you something interesting you may not know. On the third floor of this building, we have a YouTube studio and a lot of YouTube people. And it was great. We'd bring in YouTube celebrities. And every now and again, somebody would say, hey, do you guys know Google's in the same building? And the YouTube guys would go, well, yeah. You know, they own us. And then YouTube celebrities say, no way. And we say, no, really. It happened several years ago. And it turns out people didn't know. So one of the things we've been doing with Google Plus is trying to say, can we unify the experience of Google? so that if you use any of our services, you have access to all of them as an end user. But also, how do we make sure that if you want to use one of our services or APIs or libraries, you should use that in any language, except Perl, because we can't get volunteers. But the idea is that you should be able to use it web, iOS, Android. It shouldn't matter. You should have access to it. So we're thinking about taking the different platforms we've got and making them work together so that we don't have a Play console, which is different to the Google API console, which is different to how YouTube does things. We want to fix that. We want to simplify less. Part of this is also thinking about metrics, 
trying to change what we do so that it makes most sense for you. So let's try a little survey. When you guys are choosing which games to build, working in your games, putting your games into production, what are the metrics you use? So shout out, what kind of metrics do you guys use to measure the success or failure of your games? Retention, anything else? Sorry? Up, down. Okay. Virality. Virality. Anything else? Installs. This is active users. Cold hard cash. So that's a good metric. It's hard to gain that metric. The point is there's lots and lots of these metrics. And as a platform, we need to be asking ourselves, how do we help you optimize these metrics? How do we help you make sure that these numbers go up and to the right? especially that cold hard cash number. So what I'm going to do is talk about the four sets of metrics that we're currently particularly focused on. Reach, user acquisition conversion, user engagement retention, and re-engagement. So I'm just going to skim this because we only have about 25 minutes left. But I just want to give you a brief overview of some of the tools that are available in Google Plus and the way it hooks into the rest of Google that you can take advantage of to optimize these metrics or these sets of metrics. Let's start with reach. So you've built something, and we'd like you to reach as many people as possible with it. Well, for reach, you've got to go for the biggest you know, hammer we have. It's a little site called Google.com. You may have heard of it. The first and fundamental problem you're going to have as a game developer is nobody's heard of you. Or they've heard of you, but they have not heard of your new game. So for example, who here can tell me all the Angry Birds games and the difference between them all? Can you? Really? Okay, what's Angry Birds stars? There's not such a thing as stars, Star Wars maybe. See, I'm confused. My point is when I go to Google.com, I'm gonna type Angry Birds stars and it's gonna say, you didn't mean that, you meant Angry Birds Star Wars. But my friend told me Angry Birds stars and who am I gonna believe, you or the guy in the pub? So if you're going to be in search, you've got to be thinking, how do I make sure I rank for my name? How do I rank for common misspellings of my name? Because again, your users probably don't spend their time obsessing about the latest releases you've done. You know, even if you are as famous as the Angry Birds guys. I mean, they even have branded hoodies. <laughs> so first thing you've got to be thinking is, are you doing a good job with SEO? You know, do you have a website for your game where people can actually discover you through search? Um, with the best will in the world, the Play Store search is not as good as Google.com search. It's getting better, but this is still one of the best places to get discovered. So obviously you can do things like have a Google Plus page to make it easier for them to discover your brand or your game. But again, it means that when they type your name in or they type a horrible misspelling of your name, for example, Russell, is how many Zs? Again, as a user, I don't care. I just type some approximation to search, and search points me in the right direction. So the point is, search and, of course, advertising are great ways to let people to get maximum reach. They're ways where people can discover you. So they've discovered you. Now, this could mean that they've discovered you through the Play Store, or it could mean they've discovered you because they went to your website, and of course, you have a link to the Play Store so they can install your game. Yes? You guys aren't one of those people who's got a website that doesn't actually tell people how to get hold of your game? Because that's embarrassing. All right, so the users found you. You need to convert them. So conversion could be as simple as they click on the link, they get taken to the Play Store, great. If you've got a game that spans multiple platforms or spans the web and Android and iOS as well, one of the things we have with Google Plus Sign In is a feature where they can sign in on the web and then we can push the app, the game, to their devices over the air so that you can convert them on the web and they've got the game installed on their device. The point is, if the user signs in on the web or on Android, they should be signed in everywhere. So that means when I pick up, let's say I buy a new tablet, like the new HTC One, or, or, or really ridiculously big phone, like the new HTC One. It's so big, it's easy to confuse with a tablet. I buy that, I install your game, I sign in, I should resume from where I started, from where I was last time, on my other devices. 
So I shouldn't have to worry about every time starting again from scratch. So when we think about conversion, conversion could be as simple as getting the user to create a stronger bond with your game because they've signed in, they have a high score table, things like that. For traditional apps, it tends to be all about can they get installed from the web? So this is Deezer, their French company. This is what the over-the-air install process looks like. As you can see, it's just a standard Google Play widget, but they get to pick devices. Again, obviously you'd prefer people to just discover you through the Play Store, but it's this web thing. I hear it's going to be big. So it's a good place to get discovered, and it's a good place to drive installs. Again, it's a fairly easy thing to do, especially if you're a big enough company or you are trying to build a community on your own site or you're trying to build an engaging experience on your own site. Okay, you've got somehow found, people have found you, they've installed your game, they've signed in. How do you keep them? Uh, ideas? How do you keep people coming back to play your game? Sorry? Pay them. Pay them? Okay. <laughs> what else? New content? What else? Okay, something attractive to draw them back. Rewards. There's a lot of things you can do, but one of the things we've added is a little feature called incremental auth. And the reason we've added this is because it turns out lots of people use YouTube and a lot of other Google services. And sometimes you can use the data in those other services to make your experience better, more enriching. So for example, you can ask them after they've signed in, so it's a separate process, you can say, can we have access to your YouTube account because perhaps we'd like to write YouTube videos to it. So that when you have that great, that wonderful, perfect round of Flappy Bird, when you get to 64, you can actually capture the recorder and share it on YouTube. So people can see you didn't cheat. You know, if Richard captured a 366 score with a video, he could send that around now to prove he didn't cheat. But he didn't, so we have to believe he's cheating. Point being, this is a separate section from signing, and you can pull in any Google APIs this way. So that means you could do things like, do we, can we capture screenshots and maybe share them to Drive? Or are there things you have in other Google properties that we could use to augment this game? Typically, if it's a music-related game, one thing you can do is go through the users with the user permission, go through their YouTube history, and use their musical taste to influence the nature of the game. The point is, from the signing flow, you can either ask for a wide range of Google APIs, or you can ask for them incrementally and use those to enrich the experience of the game. The point being, it gives you an opportunity to personalize the game so that you can see your face, your friends' faces, the things that matter to you. <coughs> okay, so you've got a game, you've got people they've signed in, they've brought their social graph across, you've somehow made the game engaging, enticing, interesting, because you've personalized it using data you have that's available about them from the full range of Google services. How do I keep them engaged? How do I retain them? Well, if you've used any of the Google Play games in the past, you know that we have high schools, we have leaderboards. One of the really nice things you can do that actually starts to get very interesting is when I share that high score, what do I share? Now, the typical thing that people do is they share just a little blob of text. Um, as you can see, I scored zero points. That actually unlocks an achievement. But nothing stops me from editing that and, cheat and saying, yeah, I scored 1,000 points, except for the screenshot, which keeps me honest. The point being, you can start to do these kinds of interesting things to actually make the sharing experience more compelling. Because Flappy Bird's actually a pretty OK game. But what makes it great is when you get a new high score and you take that screenshot, which you have to do manually in Flappy Bird, and then you share it to the stream to tell people, look what I did. And then somebody else sends you back a message a few minutes later saying, look, I just beat your score. And that gets you to come back. But there's an authenticity that comes from having the screenshot rather than me claiming I got 1,000 points. So that's a much more powerful system. So you have achievements. But ultimately, the thing that gets you to come back is, I had a great experience. 
here's the proof of it, here's the social proof of this, and then I share that with people I know, and then they come back. Because a lot of people will try your game, it's okay, it's great, and then they get bored or life inter intervenes, and then somebody they know plays it and then they come back. So Rich, for example, has tried to quit Flappy Bird on multiple occasions. And every time he does, somebody beats his high score. And he has to come back. It's like in um, the, what was that like, Mafia film, The Godfather? Just when you think you're out, they pull you back in. Speaking of which, re-engagement. Who here actually sends re-engagement uh, emails in their games? Hands up, nobody? Come on, I played your games. You know? So you send, re okay, who here sends re-engagement notifications? Telling people, you haven't played our game for a week, please come back. You know, this is a picture of my kids. They need the money. <laughs> so everybody does this, or if they're not doing this, they're thinking about doing this. And the reason they do this is because you, a person plays the game, they get a certain way in, they get bored or they get stuck, and they stop playing. How do you re-engage them? Well, you nag them, you spam them, and you hope they come back. Does it work on you guys? So who here actually, you know, they get a re-engagement email, they get a re-engagement notification, and then they say, oh, well, I'll play that game now. OK, that guy. So spam him. <coughs> because it, everybody else finds it annoying. Because you get an email once a day. So I have a service called um, 750 Words, and it emails me each day to tell me I should write 750 words. I've learned to ignore it. I have a Duolingo um, subscription, and it emails me every day to tell me I should practice my French. I've learned to ignore it. That's because I'm a bad person. However, I'm not alone. There are many bad people on the planet. There's about 7 billion of us. And we've learned that these emails telling you to come back, these notifications that tell you to come back, it's a machine somewhere telling you you should probably play this game again. It doesn't have any meaning. It doesn't have any emotional weight. What does have emotional weight is getting a message from somebody you know, telling you something has happened, something worthwhile is going on. So for example, here's a recipe I shared on Google Plus for honey soy chicken. Of course, I can't cook because I've worked at Google for nearly seven years. So I make a post on your phone I could cook. And hopefully somebody I know will click on that, learn the recipe, and then you know, invite me around because they've made this. It could happen. Here's a song. Uh, by the way, who has heard um, the acoustic version of Justin Bieber's Boyfriend? It's actually pretty good. <laughs> you know, I can say that because it's all under NDA. <laughs> but here I can share that song, and people can click on it, and they can listen on it, to the song. But the point is, I share this, and people will say, what the hell? And they click on it, because why would I say this? And then they say, actually, it's not that horrible. And then they share it to a few of their friends. It's not that horrible, the acoustic version. And it spreads that way. This is how things like Flappy Bird spreads. And it's that message that spreads. It's the idea of somebody <coughs> actually saying this. By the way, um, in this version, this app, Soundwave, actually created that message for me. And I had the option of whether I wanted to edit it or delete this. I would never say, check out this song. I would say, hey, give this song a listen. Point is, they can, when you share what we call an interactive post, you get the call to action button, which says listen here, says list, uh, learn here. You get a pre-fill the text. You can plus mention up to 10 of the user's friends. So that's a notification the user will see across any Google product, across all of their devices. But because it's a human-mediated message, they know it came from a person, and a person was involved. For example, this is an app called Fancy, and they have a really nice affiliate scheme where you buy stuff from them. It's a business model where you, they give, you give them money, and they give you stuff. It's, you know, it's like a web 3.0 business model. And so in this case, I'm sharing a vintage Rolex Submariner watch. It's ridiculously expensive. I've, as you can see, I've hidden the amount of zeros because it goes off the edge. It's like 30 grand for a watch. But it's a really nice watch, apparently. So I share this to my stream. And if, say, you know, Larry or Sergey was you know, following me and they saw this and go, oh, that's nice, and they click buy, <laughs> 
they would be taken into the fancy app. If they didn't have the fancy app, they would be taken to the Play Store on Android, the App Store on iOS, to install the app. So if you think about this, if you were sharing an interactive post for a high school in a game, the people who didn't have the game, when they clicked on that button, would be taken to a process to install the game because somebody they know has recommended this. So in this case, let's say Larry and Sergey get their watch recommendations from me because, look, I wear two smart band things. I must know about watches. With Fancy, they actually have an affiliate model. So if Larry and Sergey bought 10 of these watches, I get a small percentage. It's unlikely to happen because they'd probably just buy the watch company. I don't get a percentage on that. But the point about this is what you have is a human who's reached a particular place within an app or a game, has found some content that they think will resonate with their friends, and you've been able to nudge them to share that. And then when those friends see that message, they click on the button, they become an app install for you. So it's not just, hey, here's a cool thing. It's here's a cool thing and an action you can perform that will cause you to install on iOS or Android. Point being, people don't really respond very well to messages from machines, but they respond very well to messages from actual people. So my parents have nagged me for 30 something years. It still works. Whereas in a few months, I get trained very quickly to ignore notifications from certain games, from certain apps. The point being, human communication, having people be the one to drive the sharing, whether it's of a high score, of a particular level, or it's a screenshot or a video of a particular piece of a game is very, very powerful. And because there's a unified Google experience, this spreads <laughs> to where are those people are using Google. And the final piece is that little site called google.com we talked about. Now, when I share a message or a screenshot or a video or whatever through Google Plus or from YouTube or, or within your game, I share it to specific circles. When those people are doing searches later on, if they're, things they search for match the post I've made, even if it's a private post, the thing called Search Plus Your World, as you can see there, that personalized search feature we now have for users who are signed in means that they will see that private post right here. So remember earlier when I shared that post about the Submarino Rolex watch and it had the phrase, if only I had a submarine? Here it is in web search. So the point we're driving at is that users can discover you through the Play Store. They can also discover you through web search. The content you sh and your users share out from within your game or from the YouTube videos of your games can be discovered again by those same users through general web search. And they click on that, they end up in that post, there's that call to action button they click on that, they've now installed your game. So you don't have this trap where you have to get all of the conversions in the first few weeks. You have content that lives out for, well, in this case, 37 minutes after I made the post. But theoretically, your content can live for months and months, and those people can still be coming back into your game months after the initial flurry of traffic. So there's a much bigger opportunity here to use all of Google services to drive growth for your games and to think about reach and conversion and all of those things and, of course, cold, hard cash. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions? Or would you just like to throw cold, hard cash? That's also good. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Hattie.